and brownfield remediation. We draw on expertise in a comprehensive range of brownfield services, which stretch back over 20 years, both nationally and internationally. Okay, introduction to the site. So between the late 80s and early noughties, uh, the site was occupied by a precision engineering works, which manufactured automotive parts. During decommissioning and refurbishment of the site, areas of impacted May ground were identified in the north east of the site and the surrounding and also surrounding displaced drainage at locations across the site. Areas of impact within the groundwater. Site challenges. Every site has them. Uh, the site was used by a previous owner um, in the, uh, prior to the 1970s for the manufacture of light affluents. Um, as part of that process, uh, the radioactive wastes resulting from the concentration of uh, naturally occurring radioactive material uh, was generated, in particular radium-226. So normal contaminated soil and objects are, are still present on the site uh, and buried within areas of the site uh, and have also been subject to a parallel remediation for radiological contamination. But clearly that um, represented some challenges for us in terms of having full-time full health physics supervision, uh, areas of no drill, uh, limited disturbance, etc. Okay, the nature of the, the chemical contamination we found. Elevated concentrations of chlorinated and non-chlorinated hydrocarbons were detected in the groundwater within uh, both aquifers beneath the site. Um, the specific contaminants of concern were identified as vinyl chloride, 1,2-dichloroethane, and also some aliphatic TPH fractions. No significant concentrations of parent compounds of DCA or VC were identified on the site. DCA is obviously considered to be recalcitrant, and can degrade both anaerobically and aerobically. Um, but we also, with the aliphatic TP fract TPH fractions, uh, these were also identified as, as potentially aerobically degradable. Okay, in terms of the conceptual site model, the site has been very well characterized through a number of phases of intrusive investigation, both prior to the remediation works and as part of the subsequent pile pilot trial works and, and the remedia remediation works proper. The conceptual site model, uh, similarly, sorry, the, the characterization of the hydrogeology was undertaken with the benefit of, of several phases of SI. Um, and the, uh, the river terrace gravels and the Tombridge well sands were both identified as secondary A aquifer units. Um, a single physiometric surface was identified. Um, the hydraulic gradients of the RTG uh, were very shallow, but a, a westerly groundwater flow direction was identified. Um, this is in uh, the groundwater flow of the, of the River Terrace gravel should be easterly, i.e., down, down valley. So that suggests that public supply abstractions in the area of the site were influencing flows. So, in terms of defining the conceptual site model and the pollutant linkages which we considered within the detailed quantified risk assessment, obviously there's no ongoing release of contamination above ground that was identified. Um, the drainage and made ground sources have, obviously, have already been addressed, uh, and the dissolved phase concentrations within the aquifer uh, did not indicate any denaples to be present. Okay, so the initial remediation strategy. Royal Haskoni undertook a, a remedial options appraisal, which quickly identified um, enhanced natural attenuation and pump and treat as a potential strategies for remediation. Uh, clearly, pump and treat systems are more effective uh, where gross contamination or free product are present. Um, with only dissolved phase contamination encountered in the soils and groundwater beneath the site. 
in situ enhanced natural attenuation was considered to be the most appropriate technology. There are two elements to our, uh, the criteria that we use to assess the, the, uh, the remedial options. Um, obviously, the, 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 the hard technical view of regarding the uh, concentrations of, of contamination, as I mentioned. But also, the site was vacant, and one of the key considerations from the client in selecting a remediation technology was the ability of the site to be sublet um, as soon as interested parties were, were identified. In situ remediation obviously has the advantage that no equipment would need to be installed and maintained long term on the site. Uh, space on the site would therefore not be taken up with any treatment compound and fewer sites, site visits would be needed for maintenance purposes. So based on evaluation of both options, it was considered that in situ enhanced natural attenuation was considered to be the most appropriate solution for the site. Also, based on the fact that we were dealing with a mixed plume with TPH in, in it as well, aerobic degradation was the pathway to follow. And ORC was identified as potentially suitable technology, and the pilot trial was commissioned. OK, so key objectives for the pilot trial were twofold. Obviously, to derive more CSM data as follows. Uh, confirming the, the direction of the lateral groundwater flow and the sub-horizontal groundwater flow regime within the uh, river terrace gravels using uh, a diatracer test and determining the extent of the connectivity between the river terrace gravels and the Tumbridge, water sa Tumbridge well sand using a, a small scale pumping test. So those were the uh, deriving more CSM data. Uh, the other objective was to provide proof of concept and design input data for use of ORC for the full-scale remediation works. So the results of the pilot trial. Um, with the pump test and tracer data, uh, we showed no connectivity between the RTG and TS. Um, the tracer test also supported the flat gradient that we anticipated. And the pilot test of the ORC advanced uh, was uh, across a limited area of the, of the site. Uh, the results proved inconclusive at that point. Um, redox potential and dissolved oxygen concentrations increased during the pilot trial, indicating the more favorable conditions for aerobic biodegradation. Uh, the trends in, the, in contaminants of concern showed a, a sustained decrease in concentration for aliphatic TPH. Uh, the concentrations of VC and 1,2-DCA also decreased, but there was some evidence of rebound at the end of that trial period. Okay, so the revised uh, DQRA. We uh, updated the DQRA with the results from the pilot trial, which uh, obviously involved the revision of some of the hydraulic properties for the Tombage Well sands. Uh, we also revised some of the contaminant properties, uh, the biodegradation uh, of both T TPH and 1,2-DCA. Uh, um, uh, obviously, the hydraulic con conductivity was, was reduced. Um, and we also actually reduced the distance to the receptor. Uh, the previous distance was based on the distance to the abstraction screen itself. Um, we updated it with a value to the distance to the boundary of the inner source protection zone. Uh, the, re the revised distance increased the, com the confidence that the remediation based on the revised SSTLs uh, would provide lasting protection for the most sensitive receptor. So the, the revised DQRA uh, produced the remedial targets, as you can see there, vinyl chloride being 42 micrograms per litre, 1,2 DCA is 1,250 micrograms per litre, and the aliphatic fractions is 853 micrograms per litre. Okay, the remediation design. The two treatment areas, uh, we based on a spatial analysis of the contaminants concern concentrations in both the river terrace gravels and also within the, the made ground perch water. Uh, they were cross-referenced with the distribution plots of the main ground perch water to ensure that um, all areas of the site in which ground water com contamination may have occurred were not overlooked. Obviously, while the remediation of the main ground and associated perch water was not required at the site, 
uh, it provided a good secondary source of data for delineation of the potential source areas. Um, in terms of contaminant inventories, um, these were calculated to, to guide calculations relating to the OR. RC data a dosage and the inventories were calculated using the saturated RTG thicknesses, the recorded ranges of contaminant concentrations, estimates of the effective porosity and partition coefficients uh, were, were used to calculate the, the mass of each contaminant concern present. The verification strategy was obviously a very key part of our remediation design. Uh, we identified a, a verification monitoring network for uh, both treatment areas. Um, we identified the monitoring frequency with a, a baseline monitoring round, um, a first verification monitoring round for two weeks post-injection, and then monthly uh, monitoring intervals thereafter. Clearly the analysis was based on VSC sweep uh, plus uh, TPH uh, CWG banding, uh, but also undertook the uh, testing for the secondary MNA indicators, VOD, COD, Langoni line, etc. Uh, again, as a, as a secondary check to assess ORC performance. Finally, in terms of data interpretation, we uh, undertook the analysis of, uh, well, we placed the analysis into time series blocks, and as part of the verification strategy, we also mapped out in advance the key data review and decision points um, and engaged with the agency to ensure that uh, those data review and decision points um, were kept to. Okay, remediation works. Obviously the simple remediation objective we gave to Regenesis was make sure it works. <laughs> ensure that the application and the injection of the ORC is sufficient to reduce the contaminants concern to levels below the SSTLs. Um, obviously how that's achieved or how that was achieved is, is going to be the focus of Garrett's presentation but broadly it was achieved by uh, setting out each tr treatment area, marking out the injection points on a three meter center grid, ensuring the target depths were calculated using all of the previous site investigation data we had, and uh, ensuring the, the concentrations of product were tailored to, um, to, to no elevated concentrations. Okay, the summary of results. At the conclusion of the monitoring program, concentrations of vinyl chloride and aliphatic C5-C6 passed the SSTLs in all 27 monitoring locations. Concentrations of aliphatic C6 to C8 passed the SSTLs in 26 of the 27 monitoring locations, and concentrations of 1, 2 DCA were below SSTL in 24 out of 27 monitoring locations. The concentrations of all COCs in all locations in area A were below the SSTL. Area B, SSTL exceedances of uh, 1, 2 DCA were limited to two boreholes and that indicated that a localized area of residual contamination was present in the vicinity of the main building. Access to that area was hampered by our, um, our no drill zones around um, the, the building and the areas of radiological contamination. Additional boundary monitoring locations within the verification network showed contaminants, constraint, uh, contaminants concern at concentrations greater than the SSTL in only one borehole. However, as a result of variable groundwater flow direction in the western boundary and the effects of source removal, uh, it was considered that the COC concentrations in that boundary borehole would continue to fluctuate around the levels of the SSTL, but would slowly decline over time. Okay. I think this, this graph really illustrates the performance of the remediation works quite well. It's showing uh, contaminants concern reduction from baseline levels. So essentially uh, vinyl chloride is obviously showing a greater than 60% reduction. 1,2 uh, DCA is showing a, a greater than 80% reduction. The aliphatic C, C5 to C6 is showing an approximate 40% reduction and the aliphatic C6 to C8 is showing 
a greater than 7% reduction. Okay, so in, in achieving closure, we essentially uh, put forward the verification report that stated that all levels of contaminants have been greatly reduced across the site. There are a few boreholes which still have levels above the remedial target for 1,2-DCA and for the uh, C6 to C8 petroleum hydrocarbons. However, based on the monitoring results, these were considered to be isolated areas and weren't thought to represent a significant source area. The Environment Agency confirmed this um, an, an acceptance of this verification report and, and clearly they uh, appreciated the manner in which the contamination had been managed at the site. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm now going to pass on to Gareth uh, to give the, the Regenesis' um, view of, of the site work. Many thanks. Good morning, my name is Gareth Leonard. I'm the Managing Director for Regenesis in Europe. Uh, Regenesis provide injectable substrates for the remediation of contamination in situ and we've been doing it for about 20 years this year. Today I'm going to be talking about um, treating the plume that Dave's been uh, talking to you about, really focusing on the remediation and the technologies that we've used in the treatment. So first couple of slides on the contaminant distribution. I think one of the key things uh, to take home from what we talk about today is the SI that was done allowed us to create very accurate remediation design. Okay? So we'll go through what we thought was there and then the pilot studies and the test, etc. Uh, extra drilling to, to, to prove what was there and get a really good idea of the contaminant distribution. And I'll talk about the um, in situ chemical oxidation and enhanced natural attenuation products that we used to treat that, show you some application slides, um, some results, and then the conclusion. So the site. This is at the north of the site. Um, behind the camera here, we have the romantically named Gasworks Stream. Now that's actually flowing to the west, uh, but as Dave mentioned, the water on the site, the groundwater on the site, is actually moving to the east. It's, it's very flat, and, and it does complicate things at the edge of the site, but essentially it's moving to the east. So, very open site, empty. Um, the, the site owner is, was, was basically trying to hand over the site or hand back the site during, during the works. So they needed to, to keep the site um, empty as people would come and look around the site. Um, now, the photograph that I've just showed you, we were actually at the top there in area A between the two red buildings there, looking south. Now, in this drawing here, up is to the north. You've got a very large building on the right there and then two other buildings. As Dave mentioned, we couldn't drill within the buildings, so we were concentrating on the contamination um, in those two zones, area A and area B. There are low levels of contamination across the site, uh, and indeed in this area um, you get um, some of these contaminants here regionally. But within these two areas was the highest concentrations that the risk assessment had shown needed uh, to have treatment. So you can see the, the scale there is quite a large site. There's 50 meters there across um, that, that area. A. So the first thing to do was look at what we could do in terms of remediation. We wanted to use ORC Advanced, which provides enhanced aerobic natural attenuation. It might seem a, a little bit of a strange choice with a chlorinated solvent such as DCA, but DCA breaks down aerobically and anaerobically. There were no parent compounds uh, left on the site. So that fact, plus the fact that we had to deal with some TPH, which only breaks down aerobically, uh, lent us to looking at um, aerobic biological degradation. Also, biological degradation is, is very good for low concentrations, uh, which we have on the site, and very low targets. You're not going to get there with something like pump and treat or chemical oxidation. Uh, to get to these very low levels, you need to get the microbes on board to, to, to break down that contamination for you. So area A in the north had the higher concentrations, around about 8,000 micrograms per litre DCA. Area B had less contamination. Um, in the north there, in area A, we just highlighted there was a, an interceptor around about that point. It seemed to be holding up some of the DCA, probably in the bedding 
uh, around that in the sector, uh, and that was the focal point. Just to the south of that, we start to do the, the pilot works. This was really, um, we, did a, we did a pump test, as Dave mentioned, and a, and a dye test, really to, to get a better understanding of um, what the groundwater was doing, whether there was links between the contamination uh, in river terrace gravels, and, and to really try and delineate better um, the, the treatment that we were going to do. We also, at, the, at that time, injected ORC Advanced on a 4-meter grid across a 10-meter by 10-meter area. Uh, it was a design based on the stoichiometry of the, the contamination on the, the site, the concentrations of contamination on the site. And we were assuming a, a fairly clean gravel. Um, and once we did the, the dye test uh, and we did the pilot test, we discovered that it wasn't quite what we thought. It, it was a little, much less permeable, much more silty. So you've got a higher fraction of organic carbon, which is going to uh, provide an oxygen sink. So the, this is the, the site here again where uh, the intercept is just in front of us there on that, on that drawing there. That's the guys just getting ready to do the injection around there. This is a direct push injection rig. We just call it through the concrete at that point and drive the rods down into the ground. The, the river terrace gravels that were carrying contamination in this area are around about seven meters below ground level to about nine meters below ground level. Above that is the alluvium that they've mentioned below that is the, the, the tighter Tunbridge sands. So the results were inconclusive, as Dave mentioned. We, we got some, we increased the redox, we increased the dissolved oxygen, but perhaps not strongly enough. We possibly didn't get a, a decent radius of influence. So we did get some good results if you look at the alphabetics, but the DCA was uh, inconclusive. So was it a failure? No, I mean, it, it's a pilot study. It, it's not just there to prove that these technologies uh, work, it's there to learn about your site and what doors you need. So it's, it's money well spent to do a pilot because we can feed that into the main design. And that's what we did. We learned that we needed to look at the doors. We pulled the um, injection grid uh, closer together and we brought on board a product called Regenox to, to kickstart the process, which I'll, I'll come on to later. Another thing that was then done, and um, while Haskelling wanted to better delineate the contamination on the site, uh, and wanted to install um, a closer knit validation um, well array across the site. So as the next stage, we drilled that array for them. We used um, sonic drilling. This is a mini sonic rig, as you can see. The guys are wearing Tyvex because of the uh, radiological issues on the site. Every time we, we, we drilled anything, this chap would turn up and wave his wand at it. And he always seemed happy and he was never wearing anything more than the, the um, high vis that you see there, so we were all safe. Um, so that's fine. What we found with Sonic, Sonic's very rapid for the, those of you who haven't used it. Um, we decided to drill and core it at the same time because we could do it at pretty, we could produce cores at pretty much the same speed as drilling it. And that gave us a lot more information. So you can see here on this core, on the left, we're going down through the alluvium. In the middle there, we're going down through the river terrace gravels. And on the right, we go into the, the Tunbridge Sands. Now, this is what we were aiming at here. These, this gravelly band is carrying the contamination. What this allowed us to do was really accurately define where the top of the Tunbridge Sands were, were where the top of the gravels are, so that we had a design for across the site. We, we could really dial that in to exactly what depth the product needed to be injected at. Also, if you look at the, the logs on the left there, the core on the left side there, sorry. If you look at the, the central one, you can see a bit of staining within the gravels. So it allowed us to really accurately understand right across the site where the contamination was and what sort of contamination was there. You, you can actually tell just by smelling these cores, whether you've got vinyl chloride, which is quite a sharp smell, you've got the, the aliphatic, which smells like petroleum, or the DCA, which is actually kind of a sickly, cloying, uncooked apple pie kind of smell. And that might say more about my culinary skills than anything else, but um, it, it, it really gave you a good idea of the distribution of the contamination. And also, once the wells were in place, we got a lot of information across the site in terms of the, the concentration and uh, laterally across the site as well. So instead of having a average uh, dose across the entire site, we could really dial in in terms of what dose is required laterally and where it's going to go vertically. 
So if you look at that area A, the straight lines you've got at the bottom there and the top in blue, that was the area that we thought we were going to treat. That was changed slightly by uh, putting in this uh, validation grid. And you can see then we've actually split it into different areas uh, by letter. And that shows you the different depths that we're going to inject at because we knew that. And then we've changed the doses. You can see three different uh, colors, high, medium, and standard. A bit of psychology going on there. But high, medium, and low dose to, to really target where, where the, uh, the contamination is and, and where it's needed. So you can see there up where the interceptor is, the green, which is the, the, the high dose that we suspected. But also we had um, down in the southwest there, that APC, where we had, had quite a concentration there that we were treating too. In the south and area B, it's, um, the river terrace gravels were coming in slightly more shallow and the concentration of contamination was less. So we split that into to two doses and you can see that we got really accurate um, knowledge of where that, that river terrace gravel was to do the uh, application. So we added chemical oxidation to the treatment to really kickstart the process. Um, chemical oxidize some of the, the contamination that was there. You're not going to be able to get to very low concentrations with chemical oxidation alone because it is contactable, but it does bring up the redox and, and, and help to kickstart the enhanced natural attenuation as well. So just to explain, in situ chemical oxidation is the in-place treatment of a contaminant using an oxidant. It's a non-biological process. You inject an oxidant into the ground. There's a redox reaction between the contamination and the oxidant itself. Uh, acronym oil rig, oxidation is loss of an electron, reduction is gain of an electron. So these things react together either by contacting, direct oxidation, or you produce free radicals, highly charged particles, that then essentially bump into the contamination and, and smash it up. It gives you rapid contaminant destru destruction. It, it's really for mass reduction um, in, in highly concentrated areas, but it was worthwhile on this side to, to kickstart the process. We have um, a couple of chemical oxidant products, Regenox and Pasulfox. In this case, we were using Regenox. Um, it's a sodium percarbonate based uh, in situ chemical oxidant. So it comes, part A is the oxidant, that's the sodium percarbonate. The part B is the um, a catalyst that we have. Basically, it comes in the form of a gel. You dilute it and then inject it into the ground, and it gives you what we call surface mediated chemical oxidation. What that does is we produce tiny little particles of iron silicate in the groundwater onto which the contamination sorts and the oxidant uh, meets that contamination and there is uh, a Fenton's reagent reaction occurs. Now what you get is millions of these little reactions occurring over about two to four weeks instead of one big reaction that you would get with Fenton's reagent hydrogen peroxide. Um, so you don't get an increase in temperature, you don't get an increase in pressure but you get the same amount of chemical oxidation, but it makes chemical oxidation very safe and straightforward. Um, this is just a picture of the uh, part B dissolved in water. It's held at a high pH so that um, it, it, it's, uh, it's wanting to crystallize, but that pH is slowing that crystallized process back. When you inject it into the ground and it spreads out from the injection point, that pH is buffered by the soil, so pH drops, and you start to get these particulates formed uh, in the subsurface, so there you can see it in the lab. Okay, so Regenox gives you fast and complete reaction with contaminants. It's very safe and easy to apply. A similar sort of um, concern on site uh, is if you were using cement, which isn't to say you, you shouldn't respect it, but compared to a lot of chemical oxidation that's gone uh, in the past, it's very safe and straightforward to use. It can be used on chlorinated solvents and uh, TPH. It doesn't give you any undesired residual byproducts and it's non corrosive. It's key for this site. This site's an ongoing concern. We don't want to put something in here that then breaks up the surfaces that are in the ground. So, because of the surface mediated chemical oxidation, the reactions are occurring in the groundwater and it's not uh, breaking down the, the pipes and wires, etc., that are in the subsurface. Very cost effective. It's been used on about a thousand sites. Maybe more now in the UK, and it's used essentially every day to every two days in the UK. We also, the, the main part of the works essentially, the, the Regenox that I mentioned would last about two to four weeks. Um, the ORC that we put in lasted about nine to 12 months for the really 
and energy. This produces enhanced aerobic natural attenuation. Aerobic natural attenuation, uh, apart from dilution and dispersion, is governed by biological degradation. This biological degradation, in turn, is governed by the contaminant itself. What form is the contamination in? Is it uh, in an apple, in which case much of it is not biologically available uh, for, for bio biodegradation? If it's dissolved, then it's in the groundwater where the microbes exist and they can break that down. There's an environmental influence, obviously temperature, we put things in the fridge to slow down the biological degradation of them. It's the same in the outside world. Uh, the good thing is that the groundwater in, in the UK tends to be the same temperature all year round, so there's, there's no real influence there. Microbiology, the, the microbes are essentially there. If you create the right conditions, uh, these, the, the microbes that you require will flourish, um, they grow exponentially, which is pretty quick, and, and they'll break down that contamination. So there's no need to, to, to add microbes. Core nutrients, for those of you who do uh, biopiling, uh, concern about the ratio of uh, the nutrients in the, in the soils is important. In the subsurface, it's not so important. Generally, the degradation of contamination um, is being held back by a lack of respiration. The microbes in the subsurface are at the point of asphyxiation. Adding nutrients, they won't be used as nutrients as such, they'll be used as uh, electron acceptors in respiration. Um, so the nutrition is, is there, the contamination is there. What you need to do is speed up the process by increasing respiration. Now, respiration is the process by which a microbe cascades an electron from an electron donor to an electron acceptor. There's energy given off by that, which the microbes then um, use to create more microbes, which then go on to respire more of the contamination. Sounds complicated, but for those of you out there listening to this eating biscuits, basically you're doing that right now. You're, you're taking in an electron donor, you're breathing in oxygen, an electron acceptor, and the uh, enzymes in your gut are then respiring that food and that oxygen to produce energy for you. Okay? So in the subsurface, there are naturally occurring electron acceptors, oxygen, nitrate, iron sulfate, etc. Oxygen by far gives the most energy in this reaction, the most free gives energy that the microbes can, can then use. So by adding oxygen, you can enhance, enhance the natural attenuation of contamination in the subsurface by about 10 to 100 times the, the natural rate. So just a quick example there on the top right there, if you look at the very left hand bar, that's the amount of aerobic microbes in, in this particular subsurface. This, this isn't from this site, it's just an example. The central bar there is where um, oxygen has been applied. So no nutrients, no change in temperature, no, no microbes added, just add more oxygen. And you can see there's a very large increase in the amount of uh, biomass in the subsurface. And this has an effect on the degradation rate. So if you look at the degradation rate of benzene in anaerobic conditions, the half-life is 24 months. In aerobic conditions, the half-life is 10 days. So that can make a huge difference uh, in terms of whether your contamination is going to make it to the receptor or not. So ORC advance is a product that we use for enhanced natural attenuation. It's a calcium oxyhydroxide. You add it to water, it produces oxygen, and leaves uh, calcium hydroxide. This calcium hydroxide then reacts with carbon dioxide produced by the microbes by when they're breaking down the contamination. This produces uh, calcium carbonate, basically sequesters that carbon dioxide, which leaves calcium carbonate lime, limestone in, in the subsurface. Okay? Um, the clever bit is that there is a controlled release technology in the product. It's an interpolation of a phosphate group by which I mean we, we basically twisted the crystal structure. This means that the release of oxygen, instead of being a flush of oxygen at the start and then a lock up of the oxygen that hasn't reacted with the water, you get a, all the available oxygen that is in the product, which is 17% by weight, is released linearly over about 9 to 12 months during the project. This means that you can inject it once and then you don't have to disturb the site again. The, the degradation will then occur over that period. So yeah, avoids loss of the atmosphere and lockup, degradation 10 100 times. It comes in the form of socks, powder which we use on this site, made up into the store and injected, and pellets. 
So it avoids pump and treat, which is important um, on this site, as, as Dave mentioned, the, the client didn't want to have pump and treat system running on the site when he was um, showing people around. Um, the no repeat application, so it lowers the project cost, avoids site disturbance, very simple and safe to use. It's been used on about 12,000 sites worldwide. Okay, so the application on this site, here's the products that we use, the ORC doing the main part of the work, it's lasting about 9 to 12 months, is on the left, and then we've got the Regenox in the middle and to the right, that's the part B and then the part A. That was, a, they were all mixed up and injected together, the Regenox lasted about 2 to 4 weeks, and then the ORC continued the remediation from that point onwards. So here we are mixing up the, the, the product, you can see the drill is in the background there. We've got a mixing tank, you add the water, dilute your products in there, they all mix in together, they, they don't have a, a problematic effect on, on each other at all. They're then injected into the ground, you can see these geoprobe rods, they're hollow stem rods, they're rammed into the ground and then uh, you inject into the subsurface. This is the injection tip that goes on the end there, just pulled it apart there so that you can see it. On the right, it's the point that takes the battering as you, you uh, hammer it into the ground. Inside, you can see there's a spring-loaded port. So when you get down to the, the correct depth, so we, we went to a lot of effort of finding out what depth we need to switch on the pumps, the spring-loaded port opens, we put in the correct dose that we've worked out for the contamination at that location, switch off the pump, the spring loaded port closes, we pull back a little bit to the next level, inject again. So we can get a very accurate dose vertically and by putting a grid across the site laterally as well. And this is a direct push uh, rig as you can see. As site get, sites get bigger, direct push rigs get bigger as well. This is quite a beast. You can see that it's got a mixing tank that basically follows it around the site. So it's about 2,400 meters squared we, we injected across on the site, 242 injection points, and it took us about 16 days, after which basically it was just down to date to come and do the, the, the monitoring on the site, and that was the only disturbance really. So the results, the vinyl chloride turned out to not be as high as, as we, we thought, it was mostly below the target when we started, but you can see that over time we've reduced that concentration down to non-detect by the end of the validation period. With the aliphatics, um, th there was two bands as you, you saw that we were looking at, a bit higher concentrations, and as you can see we've reduced those down dramatically, almost to non-detect there. The DCA, I split these out slightly, so this is the higher concentration wells, you've got up to about 8,000 micrograms per litre there. You can see that the concentration has come down rapidly over the first few months and are mostly gone from that point. We've got that one well bobbling along, um, which eventually came down below the target. We've got some lower concentration wells. You can see a couple of those bounced up. So there's perhaps a bit of salt contamination there that, that we uh, disturbed into the groundwater. Um, this can just be from disturbance when you inject. It can be from the, the, the pH uh, increase when you put it in the ground or the creation of the biomass drawing contamination into groundwater to, to break down. But then you can see that that breaks down and is essentially gone. So the results, we got a large reduction in the contamination con concentrations. We achieved the remedial targets across the site. And Dave mentioned 27 wells. That includes the, the well array that was outside of the, the treatment area. As I said, the, the site, the, this regional contamination across the site, we were really aiming at the, the worst. So we were looking at the 20 out of 20 wells, uh, the C6 to C8 in 20 out of 20 wells, vinyl chloride in 20 out of 20 wells, and the DCA in 18 out of 20 wells within the treatment area. So we got a really good contaminant mass uh, and extent reduction, which still allowed uh, Dave to take the site forward and close it out. Also, there was clear indications of continuing decline by the end of the valve. validation period and remedial design, which, which is really important in terms of providing the most uh, cost-effective treatment on the site. So there was an initial site investigation and DQRA. The regulators were brought in at an early stage.
to, to bring them into the project so they understand what we're trying to achieve and then bring them on board. We tested the conceptual site model uh, with pump test and dye test um, and the potential remediation fuel strategy using a pilot so instead of just going for it and hoping it's all right and then potentially needing to do a, another application in recalcitrant areas. We tested what we thought and we found out that we needed to change that at an early stage and that allowed us to produce a, a more accurate dosage. We then went in and did further delineation laterally and vertically which again added precision to the design, which gives a tailored dose to match the localized conditions, highly accurate design, which in effect provided a rapid reduction in the contaminants of concern with sustained reduction beyond the validation period. We avoided site disturbance on site, which was important to the client, and we achieved regulatory sign-off. I know Dave already put that quote in, but I quite like it, so I'll put it in as well. Um, and it's, I think it's an excellent example of, of time and effort spent doing site investigation. With in-situ remediation, it really pays off doing site investigation work up front because it will save you money and uncertainty uh, in the project itself. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, this concludes the presentation part of the webinar. Um, Gareth and David are just going to take a quick moment to have a look at uh, the questions that have come in. If you do have a question, please feel free to keep submitting it now so we can have a quick look at it. Um, before I hand you back over to them, just a quick reminder that immediately after conclusion of the presentation, um, you will be prompted to complete a brief survey. We really appreciate your feedback, so please take a, take a minute to fill it out. Um, also, individual CPD certificates are available for your webinar attendance today. For those uh, of you who would like to receive one, please let us know um, on the feedback form. <clears throat> right, I'll hand you back over to Gareth and David for uh, some of the questions. And um, okay, over to you, Dave. Okay, thanks. Um, question. A question, uh, yeah, sorry, a question here from Oliver Bolduck. How long was the verification monitoring period and what frequency to give confidence in long-term efficacy and plume stabilization? Well, um, essentially we undertook a, a full 12-month um, monitoring period from um, post-application of the product. Um, part of the verification strategy was to engage with the agency at key parts of that um, monitoring period. So we actually went uh, and engaged with the agency after, uh, after nine months of the, um, of the monitoring period to, to share our results, basically, and um, demonstrate how well the, the, um, the process was working. Um, so when it came to the full 12 month period, um, the verification report was presented to the agency and, um, and duly accepted. What were the implications of norm on site in terms of regulatory sign off? Okay, yeah, um, as I said, in, in terms of um, the radiological contamination, that was um, essentially a remediation was undertaken uh, in parallel with the works that we undertook. Um, that was actually undertaken by uh, Aurora Health Physics, um, directly um, commissioned by the client. Um, so essentially we've uh, got verification reports um, both for the chemical contamination within the groundwater and the radiological contamination which have been presented to the uh, regulatory authorities um, and, and I believe that uh, the radiological contamination verification report has been signed off also. There was just a question there about um, service strikes and whether we did any um, hand pitting uh, on the, the site. We didn't actually, we did um, so we're going to company to do subsurface scan to trace um, a lot of the services on the site. Most of the areas that we were in were, were relatively clear. The main issue was the um, the water uh, going into to the stream. Um, part of part of the system there wasn't in the place it was supposed to be. So we did a bit of work on on, on finding that. But uh, beyond that, um, uh, no hand picking wasn't required. Mm -hmm. oh. 
other presentations and slides available to, to download. I think we're going to put the presentation online. And am I invisible screen? Sorry. So the presentation will be available together with the Right, I see. So the presentation will go onto our website to, to be available to download. And I think that's all we've got right now. Okay, that's all the questions we have. Then that means uh, we've come to the conclusion of today's webinar. Thank you, David, and thank you, Gareth, for your presentation. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope you found the time well spent and we look forward to seeing you at our future events. Have a great day and goodbye.